Welcome to Trial by Wine. We take a closer look at crimes that highlight how fascinating humans can be. Schmitty, Swanee and Clarkey visit crimes and run them through their jury of three, debating both sides of the case to agree an appropriate, if totally fictitious, sentence. Please be advised, Trial by Wine may include explicit or disturbing content and will include drunken rambling. Listener discretion is advised. All right, how are we? Very well, thank you. Uh, super good. Yeah, really good. Mm. Still quite good. Okay. Yes. And uh, in the last 10 minutes, I had something to eat. Carla put a lasagna in the oven. Any other news? Uh, um, we've always got a Pirani out yeah, of the fridge. Refill the Pirani. You got another drink, right. So yes, I've got something to drink too. Oh. What is it? Oh, well, funny got, you should well, ask. We... This, can you see what that is? A <gasps> bottle of Oh, alcohol. it's nearly a it's, body, but it's glass. It's bo- it, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> it's a bottle and it's perfect. It's 300 mils of Coca-Cola no sugar in a glass bottle. Now, the reason I have this was I do not know where it came from, but about, I want to say 10 days ago in our local IGA, these come in a four-pack. They're that ritzy. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I can only assume that they're about to expire or they wanted to get rid of them. For the four of them, it was $3 something. And so for the first hour, I thought, oh, I can't believe that. So I bought them. All of them. I've just realised there is an out of, there is an expiry date. (laughs) I just yeah. saved it for the first time. Yeah. As if, as if <laughs> it was the 19th off. of August. There we go, 19th of August. And I thought, oh, my I'm God, sure they still good. taste fun. I bought them all to the point where our fridge I at the back looked like I was stocking a bar. It looked so beautiful. But then I had to go away on the weekend. I went back to the gong to see my family. When I got back, the kids had had a merry old time. They were like, look like they'd been on it. Everyone's bedrooms had glass bottles. I was like, oh, my God. Anyway, so I went in yesterday to get some more. And they're all gone. I'm literally scurrying, thinking, oh, maybe they're at the back. Maybe they're at the back. Uh, well, now I know why they're all gone because they were out of date as of what was that, Friday or something. Anyway, fabulous. I do love a glass bottle and I've really enjoyed them, I have to say. Excellent, excellent. What are you drinking, Schmitty? Well, I, I was on the Ara Zero Rosé in the last episode. But yes. this time I'm re- reverting to form and I have got a – Boca Cruiser, mango chutney. chutney. Mango uh, chats. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Welcome back. And boys are on the Peronis, I hear. Yep. See. And okay. they're, how big is it? Yeah, you know those big bottles that they do in Italy that I just love? Yes. It's got a yes. and they yes. sell them like at the corner shop and they've got always got two seats out the front of it so you can just go in and buy two huge beers and sit there sit out the front of it. Oh, I and love it. And watch like complete oh, derelict. Yeah, Dolce Vita. Right. Isn't it though? See? Okay. Uh, I'm Schmitty. I'm Swanee. Are you? Oh, yeah, and I'm Clarky. And together we are <laughs> Trial, Trial by, by Bira. Oh, Bira, that's Bira. right. Yes. Cocozero Cocozero. and Cocozero. Mango Chutney. I don't know how you say that. <laughs> that sounded very nice. Mango Chutney <laughs> in Italian. Mango Chutney. <laughs> Did you hear that Mario, the voice of Mario, is retiring? Really? The man who makes the voice of Mario. Yeah, he's retiring and he's, ah. I think, going to be a Mario. Mario was in Mario Brothers. You know, yeah, Mario, Mario Brothers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 He's been doing it for 30 Mario. years. He's been the voice wow. of Mario for wow. 30 years. He's decided to retire. I think he's going to go and tour the world and be a mascot or something for or spokesperson oh. for Mario. Anyway, I just heard that on the radio and thought, I don't know why that's news. Anyway, mm. uh, okay, <laughs> so my story. So I shall kick off with it. Grash, darling, grash. I thought I was done with cryptids, but oh. then I found oh, this story. God. Cryptids are not done with. <laughs> 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 but wait, there's more. Look, actually, it's not really, it's not quite in the genre, but it does feature a mythical type of being, so it sort of sort of stays on the theme. So I'm, I'm, I've added How many in. cryptids are we into now? We've done yowies. What was that called? What was it called, the yowie? Yeah, it was Yowies and Bigfoot. And we did Yowies Bigfoot. Yeah. Or the Nuntanuk. And we did Werewolves, that disgusting yes. person who was a werewolf. Yeah. I think it was Albert yeah, Fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then oh, that was Shane nice. Shatteris Abbott, the vampire gigolo. Mm, vampire. Yeah. Vampire gigolo, yeah. And here's the one that I didn't even I actually have been following this story for some time. It was on my back burner. And I hadn't made any connection to a cryptid, but then I was doing some reading. I thought, oh, hang on a minute. Oh, and um, there's some oh, recent oh, events. I'll amplify that. that. Oh, yeah, yeah. But also, 
bit of recent events which made it time to tell the story. Oh, recent events for all of us or just you? Time for this story. To uh, tell, tell the this story. story. <laughs> it's about cryptids. <laughs> And I can't think of another rhyme. Oh. Cryptids the musical. It's got a real. <laughs> it's got a real ring to it, doesn't it? Crypt- yeah, yeah, well, it's yeah. funny because whenever thing comes out as a musical, I think, oh, that'll be a load of old shit, and it's not. It's always popular. So, Cryptids the musical would probably be a. Like, Why not? Hey, smashing. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Broadway. Yeah. Here come the cryptids. Tm tm tm. Yep. Um, okay, so my sources for this story are Wikipedia, eastidahonews.com, ninenews.com.au, mamamia.com.au, people.com, bbc.com, independent.co.uk, thesun.com, thedailymail.co.uk, findlaw.com and the NY Post and also a Netflix documentary called The Sins of Our Mother and it was pretty good. Oh, this story has quite a few characters and a few twists and turns, so I suggest you get your notebooks out, especially you, Swanee. I know you like to take notes. Ready to roll. Russell, I just got to get it. Russell right. that the, paper. The only, note, the only notes, notes I have at the moment, I wonder who this refers to, Copenhagen, Iceland, Italy, Greece, Malta. <laughs> That'll be the <laughs> uh, There, my, That's my current notes. <laughs> okay. Firstly, I will introduce Chad Daybell. Chad, I can't get past his name, was born in Provo, Utah in 1968. He grew up in the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints and went to Brigham Young University where he met Tammy Douglas. He grew up in the church? Yeah, he did. He was raised in the church. Okay, just, he's, just so clarifying. he's otherwise known as being growing up in the church, which is, you know, your whole family are into it and you're raised to believe it and all the rest of it. Is it this Salt Lake City, Utah? That's all very church related, I think. Physically in the church. I don't know where oh, Provo it's the home is. Of it, I think. Salt Lake is, that is, the, yes. is a home. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. If you have seen the Book of Mormon, which I do make reference to, I have. Uh, then you'll know all about I Utah. Rem- I wouldn't remember. The wonderful place of Utah. Anyway, so yeah, he went to Brigham Young and he met Tammy Douglas. And they were married in 1990. Chad studied journalism and after university he worked as a copy editor for a daily newspaper. He also worked as a grave digger and had some other jobs just to keep the money coming in. His biggest interest was writing though and he published his first book, An Errand for Emma, in 1999. Chad's writing was generally generally religious-themed fiction. Concentrating on his writing, he published One Foot in the Grave in 2001, which was a non-fiction work based on his experiences working in cemeteries. Now, if you are a budding writer and you can't get anyone to publish your work, you know, Cryptid the Musical, you can do what Chad did and found your own publishing house. In his case, it was called Spring Creek Book Company, with a person only referred to as Douglas, no relation to Tammy Douglas, I don't think. Chad's main audience were people who were in the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and he based most of his novels on apocalyptic and dystopian futures. Mm. Now, I found the following review of one of his books, The Great Gathering, which is book one of the Standing in Holy Places series available on Amazon. Zanzibar had this to say, I read this book out of interest in the subject matter. The Mormon prophecies regarding the end of time and the establishment of the city of Zion. As a Mormon, I was curious to see what Daybell would do with this rich material. I found this book to be a profound disappointment. The (laughs) author, in short, writes like a 14-year-old. And I don't find it either instructive or entertaining to read hour after hour as an author embarrasses himself in such a dramatic way. He states in his preface that one thing that caused him to write another work of fiction, there are others, exclamation mark, was the cascade of requests from his loyal fans to write something new. Well, allow me to start a chorus of people kindly requesting Daybells to stop writing. Why? What is so offensive about this book for me to say this? It is simply Mormons are supposed to be enlightened and intelligent people and this book portrays them as completely misunderstanding or entirely ignorant of the world in which they live. That is to say, if Daybell's writings represent a common Mormon view of the world, that view is entirely foolish and idiotic. I am not talking about the fulfilment, and I'm still in the review, I am not talking about the fulfilment or not of the Mormon prophecies 
I'm criticising instead Daybell's portrayal of the world in which such prophecies are supposed to be fulfilled. He is so ignorant of that world that he makes the fulfilment of prophecies of any kind entirely implausible. I found myself laughing throughout his novel when he was not trying to be funny. Note to Daybell, the US does not import more than a small fraction of its oil from the Middle East. The Russians do not and will never want to occupy American soil and so on. Next time you write a novel with a near contemporary setting, read a newspaper first or talk to a non-Mormon or travel outside of the state of Utah. Thank you, Zanzibar, wow. for that That's excellent a review. very harsh review. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Quite honest. Did he write another book after that? He wrote several. He wrote this is the Standing in Holy Places series of which this was book one, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think there might have been five books in this series. Wow. Yeah. So Chad based his writings on visions that he received after two near-death experiences, which he claimed made him perceptible to messages from the other side. He commented, I don't fictionalise any of the events portrayed in my books. I'm really not that creative and Zanzibar would probably agree. <laughs> my torn veil allows information to be downloaded into my brain from the other side. My torn Not of his veil. brain. I'm assuming it means the other side of reality or something. The scenes I am shown are real events that will happen. Oh. Um, hmm. Are they, though? What is, 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 are Mormons the ones that believe there's a name for it, the something? What's that? There's something the called the something. What's it called? The, the secret? The secret? No, like the end it's of day. The, it's got a name for it, like the the second coming that? of Jesus Christ. Yeah, what's that called? It's got a different name, hasn't it? End of days is right. Second coming of Jesus Christ. It's like a really unusual. It wasn't really mean anything, but they call it the something like the the great calamities. No, 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 no. Like it's like flushing, or I don't know. It's not that, but I can't remember the great. There's something. The rapture. The rapture. That's it. The yeah. rapture. The flushing. The flushing. <laughs> that was close. <laughs> <laughs> Where did I get that from? What's the rapture? Yeah, it's the second coming of Christ. And okay. the idea, the I mean, I did do a little bit of reading into the teachings or the, the you know, the belief system of the Mormons. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's something along the lines, something along the lines of if you live your life in this really pious and, and um, in line with all of the rules, yeah. uh, when you die, you don't actually necessarily go to heaven straight away, but when the second coming of Jesus Christ comes, and the world is sort of destroyed. Christ will take there's three pla there's three places. I don't want to say planets, but there are three worlds. One's the celestial, one's the ter terrestrial, I think, and one's the telestial. And the the celestial is the where testicle, God I is. Think the, called, darling. <laughs> the one is where God is. The celestial is where God is, and so you're literally in the vicinity of God if you are that good that you go there. And then there's two others, and then there's everyone else who is chucked out to you know. I don't know, purgatory or something like that. I, as I say, I didn't really do tons of reading on it because it's not pertinent to the whole case. And, you know, this is a, this is a faith that is based on, and I know the Book of Mormon does point, put, poke a bit of fun at this, but it's based on the idea that Joseph Smith, who was like their key prophet sort of guy, had a vision from an angel Moroni and Moroni told him where the golden plates were. So he went in America back to out, out and dug up these golden plates, which had been put there by some ancient Jews or Christ Dishwasher or someone. Dishwasher who couldn't be bothered In America, them, in America, America, right? In America, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. And we've never seen the golden plates because they got destroyed or, so, or lost or something, but he wrote it all down. So it's all based on the writings of this Joseph Smith fellow. And then that Brigham Young, Brigham Young was the guy who, after Joseph Smith died, I think Brigham Young led the Mormons into Utah and that's kind of where they established themselves. But anyway, the, all of that comes from the storyline of the Book of Mormon, so if I'm wrong, <laughs> blame the creators blame of that. When not writing books about the end of days, Chad and Tammy had five children, Garth, Emma, Seth, Lee and Ma or Leah, sorry, and Mark. Self-publishing wasn't a cash cow and by the late 2000s, Chad and Tammy had some money worries. Around this time, Chad went back to the crypt. Well, he started grave digging again and worked at the Spanish Fork, Utah Cemetery. Not one to be daunted, Chad found a fresh audience with people interested in the second coming of Christ and was able to set the rapture, to your point, Swanee, and was yeah. able to sell more books to them, which salvaged the company. 
He also published books for a woman called Julie Rowe, uh, who is an end of days clairvoyant. Oh, Not, it's very specific. Yes, yes, yes. Not everyone enjoyed his shift in purpose, seeing his beliefs as increasingly extremist and dangerous. In 2015, Chad had a message from beyond that he should relocate to Rexburg in Idaho. So he and Tammy packed everything up and moved there in June. Chad was also involved with a sort of branch of the LDS called or some sort of group which was had these sessions are called Preparing a People. And this was all around preparing these people for the second coming of Jesus Christ, for the rapture, and included the recommendation that people ensure they have enough savings, food and goods to survive in a in a time of great unrest and plague and pestilence, which is sort of basically when it's not going to be happy. When Jesus Christ comes and judges everyone, it's going to be bad, right? And so you... He's so judgy. But the Mormons generally believe this and they believe that every Mormon should be prepared for this to some degree. So you're supposed to have savings but not too much. You're not meant to be greedy and you're supposed to have like a year's worth or a, a fair amount of things like flour, I... rice, you know, staples so that basically... You have to have enough, a bit like when people hoarded toilet paper and toilet pasta paper, and rice COVID. in the early days of the pandemic, but this is probably a bit more planned and thought out. And, you know Shmini, when you, when you say they have to have savings, when Jesus comes for the second time, will he allow banks to stay open or do they have to have it I think, in cash? And I'm not even sure if the savings have to be cash or not, but I think the intention is that when because as part of the second coming of Jesus, society will break down. So the the banks. Yeah, will so break, I feel like you know, need to be cash. Maybe but then gold who's bars. Take I mean, the cash? they were gold plates. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I don't know. Look, silver, gold bullion. Oh, look, somebody I went to maybe, school with believes they... that you need to hoard silver. Seriously. Well, they, it's good for werewolves too, but that's another story. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, look, I don't know the specifics, but this preparing a people thing. Was I don't think they do. Not a cult, but it had that sort of. Slightly hysterical and everyone buying into it kind of idea. So he Believe also it's regularly function or Coles online. Could you get your flour delivered by Coles online? Well, after the pandemic, maybe because you know they're they're better set up. But remember, before the yeah. pandemic, we we had some real problems mm. with uh, distribution. Well, sorry, in the mm. early days of the pandemic, we had distribution issues. I just feel like home home delivery and electronic banking has. Confused Come that whole way. hoarding oh, thing. No. The plan that was we need to have all of this was based on, you know, probably hundreds of years ago, I don't really know, maybe thousands. This is 2015 we're banking. talking about. People still buying into no, this did, in 2015. When did the Mormons? And now. No, but what I'm saying is when you the had Normans, to have a certain amount of stuff hoarded, the Normans <laughs> stormed Utah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> Not the Normans, the Mormons. It was like 18-something when Joseph Smith had the message from the angel of Moroni. So it's a very yeah, right. new religion, very new religion. So it's a couple of hundred years old. But even so, yeah. like what was appropriate back then would be very different now. I just feel like it needs a bit of updating so it's clear. Yeah, probably. Okay. Good to know. Noted. Good chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who, so do I, also... who do I send that to? <laughs> um <laughs> I'm guessing your local chapter of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, okay. He also regularly spoke at conferences, and it was at one of these religious conferences in November 2018 that he met Laurie Vallow. Oh. Mm. Let's learn a little bit about our friend Laurie. Laurie Vallow was born in June 1973 in Loma Linda, California. There's not a great deal on public record about Laurie's early life. There might not be much in Loma Linda either. She was the second youngest of five children, Stacy, who's now deceased, Alex, Adam and Summer, and seemed to have come from a regular God-fearing LDS family. Yeah. She married her first husband and high school boyfriend, Nelson Yanes, when she was 19 years old. The marriage didn't last very long, though, and they divorced shortly afterwards. Laurie then had another crack at love and married at 22 to William Lejoa. Le, le, yeah, le, I'm going to go with Lejoa in 1995. Yeah. And they had a son named Colby who was born in 1996. The marriage ended in 1998 and they divorced. And the interesting thing about this is now she's up to three divorces and actually they're not really keen on divorce in the mm. LDS church. So anyway, but 
clearly not a problem here. And yet here we are. In 2001, Laurie married Joseph Anthony Ryan Jr., who adopted Colby. And they also had a daughter of their own, Tylee, in 2002. This marriage was described as pretty nasty and toxic, and they divorced in 2005. And Colby has openly talked about being sexually and physically abused by Joseph. Now, Laurie had, shall I say, a close relationship with her brother Alex. Alex's ex-wife. Oh, like a Game of Thrones was, close? Yeah. Yeah, well, we don't know, but Alex's ex-wife has gone on record saying he seemed to be sexually into his sister. She's definitely, the ex-wife has definitely said, oh, yeah, it's totally Game of Thrones, not a quote. Yeah. But there's, yeah, there's yeah, not right. necessarily any evidence of that, right? But the wife also did say that Alex was a bit of a sex addict too. Right. So much so that he'd been chucked out of the church and had been sleep because apparently he'd also been sleeping with a 15-year-old at one point. So oh Alex, God. you know, he's... He's a good guy. That's Alex. I think. We I think the like thing Alex. about. I think Alex is, you know, what one might describe as a little bit lost. He was also very protective of his super hot little sister. So in two thousand and seven, he decided, and he was also pretty protective of the kids. He decided to attack Joseph Ryan, claiming it was retaliation for domestic violence and sexual abuse of the children. He showed up at an agreed visitation, and it's likely that Laurie told him where to find Joe. Mm. and tasered him. What? Alex, yeah, got him with a taser. Alex was arrested for this and he did some time in jail and I actually saw him doing a bit of stand-up comedy later and his whole routine was about how he was basically saying that he tasered a pedophile and he talked about it being his brother-in-law and that he said, you know, I walked up and I tasered him in the balls and he said, you know, I thought I'd get a parade. I thought I'd get, you know, a national holiday. Instead I got probation. But a ching, that was his his uh, jokes. Mm. Trump-esque. I actually thought it was quite funny, if I'm honest. Uh, you know, I thought he was an okay comedian based on that tiny clip. The revelation that her kids had been abused did seem to send Laurie deeper into the LDS faith. She often spoke that if she had not gone to temple and not prayed and not really gone down that path, she would have killed Joe. Mm-hmm. So in 2006, Laurie again found love and married a man named Leyland Anthony Vallow, who called himself How many Charles. Times is this now? That's a fourth marriage. Uh, okay. Charles was a Catholic, but clearly was so into Laurie that he converted to LDS for her. Charles was a little bit older as well, and from what I understand, he was quite wealthy. And some people suggest mm-hmm. that Laurie wasn't madly in love with him. But she certainly, she had the two but children, she did remember? like his bank balance. Yeah, and, and she liked him enough and um, she also had the two kids to care for as well. So, And I she'd mean, come she out of this abusive relationship. Life. No, and she'd come out of this abusive relationship, you know, where this man may or may not have sexually assaulted her children and, her, and definitely physically assaulted her. So, you know, looking for someone who was stable, who could look after them, you know, made a lot of sense. Now, Charles, being a bit older, he also had a couple of kids from his previous marriage and he and Laurie, and this is a little bit complicated, but his sister Kay and her husband, I think Kay was older than Charles, I'm not 100% sure, they had a daughter, Kay had a daughter who had a child, right? So it was actually Charles's grand-nephew and the, the daughter couldn't look after this baby, this boy, and Kay and her husband felt they were a bit too old also. And, you know, you got Charles and his younger hot wife. So they said, well, you look after the kid. So Charles and Laurie adopted Joshua Jackson, otherwise known as JJ. And JJ also happened to have autism. So we've got Colby, the older boy. We've got um, Tylee, the sister. And now we've got JJ, the adopted brother. And Tyler. things seemed Tyler, yeah, yeah. Now things seemed quite okay Is that like for when everyone. You look at a wall and go, "What do you think?" Oh, it's a bit Tyler. No, it's not like that. <laughs> so things seemed to be going okay for them, and they moved to Kauai, which is in Hawaii. <laughs> in I think late... I've seen these people. Yeah, you might have, but shush. It's super famous. It's a big. It's it's big. But big I didn't deal. watch the whole thing. I think I started watching it because the mum was really pretty. She's beautiful. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, very beautiful. Yeah. So they moved to Kauai in Hawaii 
in 2014 and by all accounts they absolutely loved it. You know, really idyllic place for the kids to grow up. Joined part of the local LDS chapter. She made some good friends. The household was really happy. Tylee had a friend who said, you know, she she wanted to stay there all the time. It was just such a happy household, all very calm and all very good. So then, however, in 2015, Laurie read Chad Daybell's Standing in Holy Places. She read the whole series, Ooh. right? So she picked up that first one. What did I say it was called? Garnering a Gathering. I don't know what it's called. The great, the great Gathering. The Great Gathering, yeah, something it like that. It sounds like the stuff that... Sebi, one of my sons, has like a, a separate Amazon account for his Kindle. It sounds like kids. And it, co- and, and it always does like a series of things. Fiction, and I look at it and yeah. I think, what shit is that? <laughs> it sounds like a series of books that Sebi's read. About but I read a lot of that sort of kids' science fiction or young adults yeah, yeah, yeah. or, or yeah, it sounds like that. fiction. You know, it's all very yeah. similar to that, yeah. Anyway, it, now he, he said it was all based on visions from the other side, remember? So she reads Standing in Holy Places, the book series, and it blew her mind. Unlike the Amazon reviewer Zanzibar, (laughs) the books really impacted Laurie and her belief system. And in 2016, the Vallos moved back to Arizona and Laurie was able to become more involved in the church scene there. And I'm not sure what made them move back, um, but whilst there she had been getting quite depressed about the end of days. Now remember I said how the end of days is not going to be a fun time. (laughs) You know, when mm-hmm. yeah. Christ comes back and he judges us all and the banks collapse and It's not like collapses. wine time, is it? No, it's not. No. It's almost the opposite. It's like no wine mm-hmm. time. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, she was actually getting quite seriously depressed at the concept of the end of days. She was pretty sure it was coming fairly soon. And she at some point even said to one of her friends that, you know, she was worried about how awful it was going to be and what the kids were going to go through. So maybe it was better off if she... They were better off if she just drove the car off a cliff one day with them all in it and killed them all before they had to suffer through the actual end of days because she wanted to spare them. Yeah. In other news, her previous husband, Joseph Ryan, remember the alleged sexual abuser? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who's also Tylee's dad, died in April 2018. And he was 59 from a heart attack. Yeah, from the tasering in the balls. Well, took a no, little it was, while this to take was, effect. That was 11 years later, yeah. That's quite a long time. Slow-running electricity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> His body was found in an advanced state of decomposition and it was sub- mm. subsequently cremated. As Laurie was listed as his next of kin because he hadn't changed, you know, his will or whatever, she was advised of his death about a week or so after he'd been found. But she failed to tell anyone about it or do anything about it and his family only found out that he'd passed away when the authorities contacted them, I think it was a long time later, because no one had actually picked up his body or collected his body and organised oh. for his cremation. And the backstory there, of course, uh, is that there was a nasty custody battle between Joseph and Laurie. Joseph wanted custody of Tylee. Laurie accused him of the sexual assault of Tylee. And I thought this was pretty poor form because at the time a therapist involved said that she thought Tyler was being pushed by her mother to make an outcry and in the end oh. Tyler actually recanted her story. And oh, what? Yeah, so depending on how you read it, right, there are stories that basically say Joseph Ryan never did anything wrong, he never did any of these things, he was perfectly fine. But I've actually heard Colby talking about the abuse that he received at the hand of his stepfather and I have no reason to disbelieve that. Exactly. So the impact of that whole custody issue and the legal ease of that was that Joseph was pretty much financially drained through both the legal fees and the child support, and Laurie made visitation extremely difficult for him. And then even when she did let him have visitation, she told her crazy brother Alex where he was so he could taser him in the balls. Ball taser. But he's now dead, right? Yeah, he died, yeah. Yeah, he's on so, heart attack, got it, yeah. Yeah. In November 2018, she attended a Preparing a People conference and this is where she meets Chad face-to-face for the first time. Now, of course, as I said, Chad's a bit of an idol for Laurie at this point. She's read his books. She's really being into him. She's fixated on him and she's fixated on the second coming of Christ. And so she sort of comes up at this conference and she's hanging around his table with his shit books and she's fangirling and, you know, she's neatening up the stacks of his books and she's saying, oh, you know, I'll help you sell your books and whatever because she's like so into him. And Chad took one look at Laurie and, frankly, got the horn. 
of God, that is. Uh, <laughs> it was like one of those Warner Brothers things where the eyes pop right out of the head and the jaw drops. Boo. Yes, I think Boo. it was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but he also recalls that he was told by a celestial voice on that day that he would meet an extraordinary woman who would change his life forever and, of course, in comes beautiful Laurie and she was stunning. And, yes, to your your description, his eyes bugged out of his head, his jaw dropped to the ground and he got the horn. And if indeed that was a message from beyond the veil, it was 100% accurate, but maybe not in the way that he hoped. So yeah. Laurie was already into Chad and his religious beliefs. She'd been making friends with others who were attending these fringe classes. So this preparing a people is a bit of a fringe thing, I think. And the seminars about the second coming of Christ, all this sort of extreme, more extreme views than your bog standard LDS person. And then after meeting Chad, things took a real turn. According to her friend Melanie Gibb, Chad and Laurie started, and she met, by the way, she met Melanie Gibb at one of these preparing a people thing too. And Melanie was quite into the whole thing. According to Melanie, they started an affair not long after they met. The attraction between them was palpable and fortunately Jesus was on Chad's side and he was getting messages from supernatural powers. So as far as they were concerned, they were the righteous and it was fine for them to have sexy time together even though they were both married to other people. And if you're wondering, no, that is not okay as far as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints community But they managed to justify it. Oh, yeah, he's like... He's best mates with Jesus, right? Everything's fine. Well, it's not the least of it. So whilst Laurie's fascination for the second coming started when she started, when she read. <laughs> On the first Sorry, coming. the second coming of Chad or of Jesus? <laughs> um, I think I we're just actually read, clear on this now. I, I absolutely know that when I wrote that, I thought they're going to they're gonna throw me at this point because I've said yeah. second oh. coming. Of both, right? Too many times. So her fascination for the second coming of yeah. Christ uh, started when she read Chad's books and it was really going once she was hanging out with him and he was preaching. Charles went out of town for a work gig and Laurie offered for people to stay over at her place and guess who stayed over? That would be Chad. That's right. No, not Jesus. No, no, Jesus, mate. He's not Jesus. The, he doesn't say he's Jesus. The, yeah, no, I was he's just wondering He's not the little baby Jesus. They're both coming second. Oh, they're both having a second coming, but I reckon this is going to be Chad's third. I think Chad had more than one, or sorry, more than two. That's right, yeah. So Chad told Laurie early on when he met them that they had lived together in past lives and she's like, oh, cool. And that had happened at least 21 times throughout history and they were destined to be together. And at no point does she think, hmm, sure. No, she's like, yep, absolutely, 100%. Chad documented their early relationship which in what can only be described as some sort of erotic short story that frankly needed a <laughs> self-publishing book company to see the light of day. He called himself and her James and Eleanor and they're the protagonists and they meet and they're instantly attracted. They sort of fumble about and half-heartedly try to avoid getting jiggy but in the end they just can't keep their hands off each other. Eventually Jesus they end up... To do it. Mm. Eventually they end up having a huge makeout session, or rather I'll quote from the story, their spirits could not be restrained any longer and a long-awaited makeout session took place. This was manifest in the... session. I know. <laughs> Remember Zanzibar did say he writes like a 14-year-old. Keep, keep clean, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So don't the next too, line is... Don't too pornographic. This was... Ma- <laughs> yeah, hang on, it's going to get rude now. This was manifest in the mortal world to James and Eleanor through the scientific phenomenon known as hornbaggery. Loin fire. Loin fire. <laughs> the scientific phenomenon known as loin fire. Loin fire. And or and I wrote, and in common parlance, horny hornbags. <laughs> <laughs> loin fire. That loin fire, great. yeah. <laughs> oh, ooh, Tony, I'm, I've got a spot of loin fire and I don't need an STD. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Go and get a cream, doll. I think yeah. some of the second show. Antibiotics, shelf. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not Laurie, again. Laurie, Laurie and her brother Alex also were totally into Chad and his teachings and who wouldn't be? Chad told her she was an exalted hey. goddess with visionary capabilities. They went around trying to recruit others. 
Laurie was convinced she was to lead the 144,000 who would rise up and she and Chad would lead the people at the end of days, the rapture, the second or third coming of Christ, which was scheduled for July 2020. She was going to, I know, mm, it's unfortunate. Anyway, she was going to church daily, soaking up all that celestial goodness, and she and Chad thought they could teleport and change the weather. That's all tracking now, isn't it? That sounds right. Mm. Sorry, I missed that. She could change the weather, did you say? She and Chad had got to this point because they were so connected to God and they were so beyond everyone else that they thought that they could teleport. They told people, we can teleport and we can change the weather. Now, this is more insulting as far as I was concerned, is that they also became podcasters. (laughs) Oh, no, that's too close. Uh, Which Laurie was doing. I've heard a bit of it too. Ours is much better. Laurie was doing throughout 2018 and she and Chad recorded an episode called Time to Warrior Up on the Preparing a People podcast, which, by the way, I tried to listen to. Time to Warrior Up. Weirdly, the audio files don't work for some reason. Hmm. Oh, that's weird. Um, Are they masturbatory warriors that it's time to masturbatory warrior up? Chad. It would be so much better if they were. To be honest, <laughs> having, having listened to a bit of it, it's like, oh, goodness me. It's, a, um, it's the second coming of Jesus and there's a whole lot of masturbatory warriors. <laughs> I tell you, I'd prefer that. I'd prefer to have listened to that. And that's saying something. Um, unsurprisingly, Laurie's relationship with her husband Charles was deteriorating at a startling rate. Whilst Charles had converted to LDS for Laurie and from what I read was actually quite a devout Mormon, he was not okay with Laurie's more extreme beliefs or the fact that she was having an affair with Chad. No. She also had a falling out with her brother Adam. She told him she'd seen Jesus and she'd had a bit of a chat with him. She was a higher priest. She was in a high or had a higher priesthood than others. And she was also, by the way, married to Moroni. Yeah. Remember the angel Moroni I told you about earlier? You know, the one who appeared to Joseph Smith and told him where the golden plates uh, were. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, she said yeah. she was married yeah, right. to him. Yeah, yeah, she and oh, she, anyway, yes, yes, she did. Um, <laughs> yes. It wasn't just there was a simple answer. And the funny thing is, her brother Adam, who appears to be a pretty sane individual, was like, um, Alex, no, Adam, excuse me, Alex is the not sane. Well, sorry, Alex is the lost one who hangs out with her all the time and may or may not have right. the hearts for her. Adam is another brother. I've who's perfectly forgotten sane. about Adam from the same well, mother. Yes, Adam from the same mother. And uh, Adam was like, when she said, oh, I've seen Jesus, I chat with him, he's like, no, you don't. And she's like, yeah, I do. Yeah. And he's like, no, you don't. And then she's like, you're dead to me. So, or she didn't quite say that, but she never, yeah. she didn't speak to him. She cut him off. So it wasn't just Laurie and Alex who were under Chad, so Alex now, under Chad's spell. Melanie Gibb, that friend of Laurie's. Melanie uh, Boudaroo, Boudaroo, yeah, that's how I'd say it, Boudaroo, Boudaroo, uh, who was Laurie's niece. And another friend, Zulema Pestanez, who was actually married to Alex for a very short time, they were all in this clique. You know, I said before, Chad and Laurie were trying to recruit Was it a loin fire clique or was there only loin fire no, between two was of them? No, it was only loin fire between the two of them. Yeah. But these other people were sort of into this, you know, end of days stuff, lots of praying. Right. Storing their flour and cash. Yeah, and Laurie and Chad... We kind of had this mission to recruit all these people. From what I can tell, they might have recruited five or six people. So they weren't terribly successful. But they had this little clique together and they were praying together and they even were doing some sort of like spiritual healings of people. Sounded a bit like an exorcism to me, but, you know, because these people were possessed by dark spirits and that sort of stuff. So they were helping that Mm. sort that out. And then Laurie, here we go, started to talk about zombies. And there is the connection to my Mythical Creatures series. Well done. She told people, and Melanie being one of them, that her husband Charles had died and now he was possessed by some dude called Ned Schneider. Ned Schneider. (laughs) Ned Ned Schneider. It's such a random name. So random. (laughs) And and she also told Melanie... It's so bizarre, Melody Gibb. I have Zombie, to say Melody zombies Gibb aren't possessed, though, are they? Oh, the whole zombie thing doesn't work either. That's right. So right, I think okay. they're confused yeah. with possessed demon possession, but then they talk yes. about zombies, and it's all just whacked. Yeah. So yeah. 
she told Melanie Gibb, because remember there's Melanie Boudreau, however you say, as well, so I'll just keep saying Gibb to distinguish them, that she and Chad were part of the Church of the Firstborn, which is a fundamentalist doomsday cult, and the little group believed that the only way to deal with zombies was to kill them, which is actually true, right? So if you ever actually, I've seen Shaun of the Dead, I've seen The Walking Dead, you know, I've seen fiction. I mean, I mean, when you say true, you mean, <laughs> I mean fi- in fictional. The fiction, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's what you should do, right? But to your yes, point, right. <laughs> zombies usually are generated by some cataclysmic event or a pan, like a, a disease or something. They're not possessed by a spirit called Ned Schneider and then you're a zombie. <laughs> and Ned not, Schneider, like, the father of zombies. <laughs> Yeah, and she never said, she never said that Charles was trying to eat her brain, and everyone knows zombies try to eat brains, right? So there's right. something wrong in this. Yeah, I mean, if that's all you're going to take from this story, that also, zombie. Cha- yeah. also yeah. Charles yeah. sounds like he'd be quite hungry if he was a zombie possessed by Ned Schneider trying to eat Laurie Vallow's brains. I know. <laughs> well, she would because well, there wasn't much sm- left. It's a that's small right. meal. Yes. So as I said, uh, they thought the only way to deal with zombies was to kill them and they had this whole scoring system, particularly Chad and Laurie, for how dark a person was or whether they had bad spirits in them or how perceptible how dark? they were. To- Can we just clarify how dark? Like, Does that mean how evil? Not, no, it's in dark spirits, how evil, yeah. Yeah, right. How dark they Good. were in evil because they, could, they say, talk about like dark spirits well. all the time. Probably, yeah. you know, who can say? Who can say? And how perceptible that these people were to being taken over by dark spirits, right? And it was a it was on this scale of like negative six. They scored people based on like negative six to positive six. And I mean, that's scale. a random scoring scale too, isn't it? Dark spirit scale. Dark spirits. And I think if you got okay. really bad, you became a zombie. I, I don't really understand. The point is no one really understands it except Chad, Chad and Bloody Laurie because it's insanity. And even the police yes. in the investigation said there was no kind of – you couldn't work out. It just seemed to be that if Chad said – Clark, he's a four. Uh, he's a four point one D. That's what he was. Like there was no way of saying. Okay, so how did you arrive at four point one D? Are you sure it's not a three point seven five C? Exactly. You know, like I, I don't know where you got. Could you recalculate? And he might even be yeah. an L. He might be a light spirit. Yeah, exactly. Chad seemed to think that he was able to see this and scare some of the spirits away at certain points. You remember the story I did about the other Mormon murderer, Jody Harris, how there was like thousands and thousands of text messages between them. This is one of those cases where the text messages and that communication that happens between them plays a really big part in trying to unraveling in the and, evidence. And, yeah. In the evidence, yeah. And in one of these text messages, he, he he sort of suggests that JJ, who's the little, he's a seven-year-old boy, he there was a one. dark spirit around. Yeah, there was a dark spirit around him, but you know he he scared it away, so he stopped him from being possessed. Now, Charles at this time was increasingly concerned at how batshit crazy Laurie had become. While he was away for work, Understandably. Laurie, yeah, Laurie had Alex go to the airport and take his truck and then he, they drove back to the house, they cleared out all of his belongings and so when he came home, there was no sign of the kids, all his stuff was gone, his truck was gone, so he called the police. And there is body cam footage of him telling the police that she's he doesn't know where the kids are. She's gone off the reservation. And he's pleading to the police, not in a kind of bizarre way, but he's saying, I don't know how else to tell you this. She's gone totally bonkers. She thinks she's, you know, hearing voices from angels. She thinks she's married to Moroni, you know, like she thinks all these things. They, the kids are not here. I don't know where they are. I'm very concerned. And that's even in that one, and it's, it's sort of funny, but it's not funny, he says, she says I'm possessed by a spirit called Ned Schneider. And <laughs> the policeman says, who's Ned Schneider? And J- Charles goes, yeah. I don't know. Exactly. He's no one. He doesn't exist. And we laughed about Ned Schneider, but even you know, poor Charles himself was like, I don't know who Ned Schneider is. There's no connection to me apart from being possessed by him. But, you know, after this, they, you know, they went, they found Laurie, they booked her, they brought her in for questioning. And she comes across, I've seen again the uh, interview, she comes across, Pretty reasonable. She's not showing signs of being bad. She's hot though, yeah. 
She's a mm. little flirty, not too much, and she's she's sort of like, oh, well, you know, he had an affair. I found out when he was away that he, I saw something on his phone or whatever, and I know that he had an affair. And so, yes, look, to be fair, I did organise to have his truck gone and his stuff, but I'm just pissed off with him and whatever. And then, he, then Charles has actually asked for her to undergo a psychological evaluation which is affection, effectively he's saying as a spouse she needs to be sectioned. And the police say to her, look, you know, he wants you to have this psych evaluation. It's it's basically like getting you sectioned. Like we could take you there and make you go or you can go of your own free will. And she's like, oh, no, fine, I'll go. And so she goes off. The police don't really take – at this point the police are sort of looking at Charles as being – Mm. The issue? The problem. Yeah. yeah. The problem because she's not talking about Ned Schneider, she's not raving, she's, and you know, 20, she's got Tylee what, in there with her, what I think. Year? I'm not 100% sure. This 2018, is 2018, did you 2018. say? 2018, yeah. This is towards Me the end too of 2018. Me too is building? Yeah, it's but built. he wasn't not, abusive. Not, he wasn't abusive. No, it Charles. was. No, no, what I'm saying is from the police's point of view. Oh, totally. Me too is maybe at that point. Maybe, maybe. Definitely. Yeah, right. When we came yeah, so, uh, yeah. But she's, she's also not accused him of being abusive. She just said that he's had an No, no, she's she playing a game she's... that makes it look like he's the problem and the police go, yeah. he probably is the problem. Obviously also she does a pretty good job going to get her psych evaluation because there's no evidence that they found her insane she or went. a problem. She went, yeah, she went of her own free will, rocked up, did the evaluation, yeah. passed, no problem. At the same time, Charles was so concerned about this behaviour that he sought a protective order against Laurie and w- because she was threatening him. So he'd thre- she'd been threatening him with violence, she was going to kill him, all this sort of stuff. And he was very concerned about JJ and Tylee, although he couldn't name Tylee in the order because she wasn't his biological daughter and he hadn't adopted her. So Charles okay. t- tried to get Laurie to see what was happening because she's completely fixated on Chad. In a text message that Charles sent, he says, I'm the only one brave enough and loves you enough to call you on this BS, which is all it is. You asked me if it ever hurt anyone and the answer is hell yes, just look around you. So in February 2019, just three months after Laurie and Chad had met, Charles filed for divorce. He said Laurie had told him she no longer cared about him or JJ and she took off for a period of time as well, just sort of disappeared. So on July 11, 2019, Charles went to Laurie's place to pick up the kids. Alex was staying over at Laurie's place for no apparent reason, although she told the police he was there as she had feared that Charles would be difficult when he came to get the kids. Charles entered the house and there was a bit of a kerfuffle, a bit of yelling. Tylee came into the room with a baseball bat and sort of poked it at Charles, like, get away. He took it off her. Tylee and JJ and Laurie, allegedly, left the house and then Alex Cox, her brother, shot and killed Charles. He immediately called 911, claiming that he had been defending himself. When the police appeared, Laurie wasn't there. So, and I'm not convinced. I don't know whether she left before Charles was shot or just immediately after Charles was shot. She had taken JJ. This is what you do, right? Either there'd been a nasty altercation or possibly your husband's just got shot. Yeah. Yep. She just had taken JJ to the McDonald's and there's footage of her in the CCTV doing this. And, and then she took him to school. No, and then she and Tylee went off to buy some flip-flops. Yeah, that's the, the top of mind thing. It's one thing to say I've got to take the kid to school, I've got to get him some breakfast, so it's not great. We'll take him through Macca's, drop him off and head back because I know there's this thing going down at home. But they spent a fair amount of time looking for these flip-flops. So when we get back, Alex said that Charles had hit him in the head with the bat, like at the back of the head, and he did have a small cut to the back of his head at the time. He said he then shot Charles basically in self-defence. The investigators did note that the second bullet wound in Charles's chest had been administered by someone standing over his prone form. So he shot mm. one standing, falls to the ground, yeah. shot again from over, yeah, over the top of him. Yeah, I'm so scared. Laurie showed up. And this is again caught on body cam, cam footage. Laurie shows up while Alex is out the front of the house with the police. And again, you know, we see it. Tylee's also with her. They are walking up towards the police, so the camera is pointing at them. And the policeman says, like, who are you? What are you doing here? Ma'am, ma'am, you know, you have to stay back. Who are you? And she says, I'm his wife. 
And when I saw it, I was a bit confused because I thought, you're not Alex's your wife because yeah. Alex is sitting in the gutter yeah. of the, you know out on the nature strip, and she's walked towards him. And I thought, hang on, you're not his wife. And then mm. I realised she's talking about she Charles, met. who's the yeah, victim. Yeah, been shot. Right? Yeah. But if she'd left before he was shot, why yeah, is the first thing she says, down. "I'm his wife"? Yeah. That's why I suspect yeah. she was there, yeah, or at least Alex had contacted her before he called the police. Or she, or she knew that that's what was going to happen, so she left knowing that he was going to kill Charles. It could have been set up, that's right. And, and she shows back. absolutely yeah. no sign of concern about Charles. She never asks about him. She just goes and leans on the front of her car. She's not smirking, but she's sort of just very mm. relaxed for someone who's, whether they're estranged or not, person who you know has been killed. And she's pretty relaxed even if her brother's killed someone, you know what I mean? Like Correct. she's pretty yeah, chill yeah. about the whole thing. Yeah. However, with, with the witness accounts of Tylee, Laurie and Alex, the police accepted the self-defence claim and did not pursue the matter. Laurie, who remember is such an eternal goddess, sent a text message to Charles's children, he had two kids from an earlier marriage, telling them that Charles was dead. And then she ghosted them on and off for a few days and totally refused to tell them what had happened. She is so empathetic, don't you think? So she's just gone, so, your dad's dead, but I won't tell you anything more. Pretty. Yeah. So, hey, blah, 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 just to let you know your dad's dead, yeah. It's so Via devastating, text. it's terrible. Via text. One of them, and then, again, this is a series of texts. Step that mum of the year say. award. And the kid's like, um, what do you mean? What happened? Silence, silence, silence for hours. He's like, it's three hours since I sent you that text. Could you tell me what happened? It's three days since I sent you a text. You told us our dad died via text. You haven't mm. even told us that how what has happened. And in the end, yeah. he sort of gives up and he goes, fine, when can I come and get dad's stuff? At some point she says, yeah, yeah, I yeah. just need some time. You know, this is devastating. It's It's really broken me up. I just need some time to sort things out. And she basically just replies on when your dad's funeral is going to be. It's not a thing you do to someone by text. Don't. Let alone the ghosting and. Correct, yeah, yeah. Um, she also then called the life insurance company within days of Charles's death, only mm-hmm. to discover that he had changed the beneficiary of his $1 million policy from her to his sister Kay. Brilliant. A couple of weeks after Charles's death, yes. yep, Laurie sent a text to Kay, the sister, that said five kids and no money and his sister gets everything. And she's talking about JJ Tiley, Colby, <laughs> Ryan, and the two stepsons and herself, yeah. of course. She also sent a text to Chad complaining about not getting any of the money, to which he responded something along the lines of, I wonder if he changed it when he got two gunshots to the chest. <gasps> and then she says something what? like, no, I think it was Kay. Like there, there's this whole conversation, but I just thought, Again, he's this religious leader, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Just, I wonder what Jesus would say about that, Chad. <laughs> that was July 2019. Laurie packs her kids up and they move to Rexburg, Idaho, where, of course, Chad lives with his family, his wife and five children. She told everyone that they had to, she didn't tell anyone where they were going, and she said, we have to move because people are after them and they have to get away and we can't tell you where we're going, and so she just does this runner. And this, when I say everyone, like her friends and her parents and Colby, her older boy, who at this point has got married himself to a girl called Kelsey, and Kelsey in this period I think is also pregnant and she had a difficult pregnancy. So Colby and Kelsey. From the first coming or the second coming? Just just asking for a friend. However many, however many. Uh, but they they're they're sort of separate to it. They've distanced themselves a bit from it. And and, and when they do ask, where is everyone? She's like, Oh, I just gotta run away, you know, people are after us, whatever. So Chad and Laurie had a list of her friends and family, as I said earlier, about that rating, and they'd rated all of them as light or dark spirits on a range of six D and Six for dark, it's the worst one, and 6L, like really, really good light. So, for instance, Joseph Ryan, who is now the the dead ex who died of a heart attack, was a 4.1D, meaning he was 4.1 dark, and I don't understand what where the 4.1 comes from. To your point earlier, it could be 3.75. <laughs> this list was somehow le- or could be 5.1. I mean, I don't know where he gets his numbers from. When Charles, back when Charles was trying to get, people to pay attention to the fact that Laurie had gone batshit crazy. He was sending emails to the family saying, look, I really need your help. 
you know, she's nuts and da da da. And at this point, because the kids have, so, like, Laurie's disappeared and they start to get a bit concerned about things. Kelsey, Colby's wife, starts to do a bit of investigative journalism of her own because also, by the way, Laurie didn't like Kelsey, no surprise, and Kelsey found... Laurie doesn't like anyone. Well, well the, the whole thing about this, who, the the rating is all about really how Laurie feels about people or why she thinks they respond to her. Mm. Charles had sent an email which had this attachment, which had this thing about the ratings. So Kelsey was able to find the ratings and she saw that she was a 3D on the list, which she wasn't very happy about. And then she eventually sees who this list was sent by to Laurie originally and it was sent by Chad Daybell, right? So this is where we mm-hmm. start to connect all that. But also the rating system had something to do with the zombie bit as well. So uh, honestly it doesn't make any sense. But Ch- uh, Chad and Laurie had decided that their mission in life was to kill zombies and that's okay because they're not people anyway because the real people have already died and now they're possessed by yeah, the yeah, Ned Schneiders, yeah. which makes them yeah. zombies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Laurie's I mean, I'm, a strange I'm following brother. It. It's, it's the classic zombie story, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and Laurie's, you know, got this estranged brother, Adam. He, they've said he's gone zombie. He's totally gone zombie. And they say, she sends Alex, the other brother, a text going, oh, have you heard the news about Adam? And he's like, no, what? And she goes, he's a Z, right? So she doesn't say zombie in her text. She says he's gone Z. And he goes, when did that happen? And she's like, oh, about the time that he was supporting Charles. Oh, surprise, surprise, right? The time that he did something that gave me the shit, so now he's a zombie. Yeah, he's dead yeah. to me. Yeah. So, so that's the kind of thing that happened. Also, Brandon Bodaru, who was, you remember Laurie's niece, Melanie, who's also in the clip? Melanie, yeah. Yeah, the other Melanie. She was married to this guy, Brandon Bodaru. Bodaru? Whatever, Brandon. They were absolutely sure he was a zombie too. He was on the shit list, let's put it that way, because yeah, yeah. he and Melanie were going through a nasty divorce. So they were estranged at this time. Oh, uh, yeah, right. So, Dead to us as well. Okay, so if you thought this was hard to follow so far, the next part of this story is hard to tell in a chronological order, so I'm just going to talk about Tammy Daybell, Chad's wife of 29 years. Now, 29 Ta- years, wow, okay. Tammy Douglas, yes, she met in, they met in university. So Tammy was a healthy 49-year-old who had divided her life to her five children and husband. Unfortunately, sometime in September 2019, Tammy likely discovered her husband was involved in an illicit affair. Had the loin fire. Oh, no, I think my husband's got the loin fire. Loin fire, yeah. (laughs) We don't know much about what Tammy thought or knew, but apparently Chad starts to talk about Tammy having dark spirits in her. Uh. And I'm inclined to think she discovered he was a complete nutty asshole. you know, maybe went a bit cold on him, started to make comments so very coincidentally, she's got some dark spirits. On October the 9th, 2019, Tammy reported to police that someone had shot at her in her driveway with a de- defective paintball marker. So it's a paintball. She didn't recognise the shooter and he got away. Ten days later, Tammy died suddenly. What? I know, shocking. Like who would have seen that coming? Probably, certainly not Tammy, but honestly, she's getting shot at. Her husband's an absolute nutbag. Chad told the police. She's got the dark she, spirits in her. No, she had a really bad cough and oh. she wasn't feeling well. And the next day when he woke up, she'd passed away in her sleep. Oh. But he sad. also. Really, ref- though. Yeah, he, but also lovely because, you know, she didn't suffer. She didn't suffer in any way. He also oh. refused an autopsy. And, and I don't know oh, how this happened. Are you allowed happens. to do that? Apparently. Yeah, he refused an autopsy. Yeah, and the coroner said, oh, okay, fair enough. So Tammy was buried and her death ruled natural causes. So what did pique some interest, though, was Chad and Laurie getting married in Hawaii two weeks after Tammy's death. (laughs) Death, not even funeral. Death. That loin fire works fast. In fact. Very effective. (laughs) Yep. Later <laughs> investigation of her phone found, and her iCloud found that Laurie had been searching for wedding dresses in Hawaii, as in to buy a wedding dress in Hawaii, on the day of Tammy's funeral. Perhaps if the reincarnated lovers had shown a little more patience, people would not have immediately started to question what was going on. Chad also was a recipient of a $430,000 life insurance policy after Tammy's death, Mm. which helped to set them up in Hawaii because they ran away there. So this is November 2019 and Colby, Laurie's 
oldest boy, starts to be concerned because he hasn't seen Tylee. And JJ's grandparents start wondering where he is. So Grandma Kay Woodcock, Charles's sister, called the police in late November trying to find out about JJ. She managed to get into Charles's Amazon account and she found an order for two green Malachite wedding rings that was placed after Charles was killed and before Tammy died and it had a delivery address of Rexburg. So they kind of worked out from that point, it's Charles's Amazon account, he's dead so he's not putting the order in. It must be Laurie and she's had it sent to this Rexburg account. Remember she ran away not telling anyone where she was so now yeah. we have an address that we can maybe find her. So oh, the police go to the address and Alex, uh, good old brother Alex, opens the door and Chad was also there. Alex told the police that JJ was with his grandma, to which the police said, I don't think so because grandma's the one who called us looking for JJ. So they asked for Laurie's address and were given Melanie Bordereau's address and she'd also moved there when Laurie did. So when they moved to Rexburg, it seems that all of those people in the clique all also moved to an ap- apartment complex. Melrose Place for... Uh, yeah, for the faithful. They've all converged on this strange <laughs> little complex. So we've got Melanie in there, we've got Laurie in there, Alex is there, you know. Oh, Lestem, what did I say, Zulema, she's there. I hope that they had the whole apartment block taken up because imagine if you were the one non whack oh, job awful. in that, like, like Melrose Place kind of thing and there's one person who yep. is not a whack job. <sighs> Move out. So they go over there and they they get onto Laurie. They find her and they knew something was wrong. They go to the apartment. They're all there. They speak to Laurie and she goes on about how people are causing her trouble and looking for her. And then she said JJ was staying with Melanie Gibb in Arizona. So the police try and get onto Melanie Gibb and they can't get onto her. So they go back to Laurie who says, oh, yeah, look, oh, she's taken him to blah, blah, or they've gone to something. That's why you can't get onto them. And the police go, can you get her to give us a call? And she's like, no problem. So she promises to get them to call, but, of course, Melanie doesn't call them. Eventually, quite a long time later, she does call the police and she said that she hadn't seen him for months. So on September the 23rd, there's doorbell footage, you know, like a ring doorbell, those video doorbells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's doorbell footage of JJ playing out the front of the house. He's wearing his red PJs and black socks and he's playing with a friend. His school confirmed that he'd been there and then on the 24th of September, Laurie called the school and said she was taking him out to homeschool him. So that's JJ. The last time we see JJ with confirmed sighting is around the 23rd of September, 2019. In October 2019, two Venmo payments were made from Tylee's account to Colby saying love you or whatever, which was the last time Colby had heard from Tylee. When he said to Tylee via text, he's getting these responses, he's getting these emails and stuff, sorry, text messages. She's saying, I'm I'm safe, I can't talk to you, I'm too busy, all this sort of stuff. And he, you know, it's a swanny moment. He's like, this isn't her. The, The punctuation's wrong, the spelling's wrong, the syntax is not the way she would normally speak. So he he tries to ring her a few times. Eventually he sends her a text and say, and he rings mum too. He calls Laurie and he says, where's Tylee? Oh, no, no, she's fine. She's safe. Where's JJ? He's fine. He's safe. Everything's fine. So in the end he sends Tylee's phone a message saying, this isn't you. You know, this doesn't sound like you. Call me. And he doesn't hear from her again, either by text or by call. As I said earlier, Kelsey sort of was online stalking Laurie because they're getting really worried about where the kids are. And she remembers the bit about Charles. She finds the mad list of people and she discovers in that list that Tylee is a 4.1D on the list. So that's not good. Tylee was last seen on the 8th of September in 2019 at Yellowstone. So Tylee's is equally bad as Joseph. Yep. And Joseph her was a 4.1D. Yeah, right. She's a 17-year-old daughter. So Tylee's mm. 17 and JJ's 7. So Tylee's last seen on the 8th of September on 2019 at the Yellowstone National Park with her brother JJ, her mother Laurie, and her uncle Alex. Alex. Melanie Gibb told investigators that Laurie and Chad had asked her to lie about where JJ was, which she'd refused to do, and then they realised Tylee was also missing. So Laurie, now in Hawaii in November, married to Chad, refuses to cooperate with the investigation, telling everyone she knows where JJ is and Tylee, don't worry, 
I'm, I'm not telling anyone, I'm protecting him, I'm keeping him safe. Um, you would never, you would never let your children go unsafe. And she says, quote unquote, he's safe and happy. I know where he is. He's safe and happy, but we have to, you know, he's, I have to keep his whereabouts secret. Um, she, she sort of was suggesting that because Charles had died, that JJ's parents were going to try and get custody back of JJ and that's why she'd run away and that that's the people who were after her kind of thing. Now, Melanie is a bit of a badass, Melanie Gibb, and she secretly records a phone call that she makes to Laurie and Chad and by this time she's pretty sure things are very bad. Something's she's gone on horribly them. wrong. And she asked, it's about a 20-minute phone call, and she asked Laurie why she told the police that JJ was with her. And Laurie says, and I will quote this, she says, I just needed to use to have somebody that, so I wouldn't have to tell anyone where he really was. So as she's saying, like, I just needed to use, I, mm. I mean, that is so, for me, so telling. I just need to use you as an excuse. Yeah, or, you know, yeah, yeah. Melanie is quite impressive. She's really calm. And at one point, Laurie is like, "Why are you? Why are you being like this? You know, are you recording this for the police or something?" And Melanie's just like, oh, "I don't know what you're on about." And she just, she even goes into this. I read this scripture the other day, and she, you know, like she, she goes, "This is Melanie mm. behaving like she normally would." I think. I think that's the point of it. And you know, it mm-hmm. made me think about you. But it's really funny because she, she pulls out this piece of scripture where she's basically saying in this scripture this person's doing a bad thing and God's not happy with them and they should repent. And Laurie's like, why are you reading me this scripture? She's like, well, I think that you and Chad may be maybe not doing such a good thing, you know, kind of. And they go, what are you talking about? She's like, I don't know, having an affair, you know, and they're like, what are you talking about? You know, like, You're a 4.1D. <laughs> I th- I'm pretty sure she went down. She went right down to a six at that point. That's right. What you do hear in it is how manipulative and kind of crazy that Laurie and uh, Chad are on that call. So the police and the FBI attend Laurie's house on the 27th of November, but the house is abandoned, and neighbours say they'd seen Laurie and Alex packing a truck the day before. Suspicions now are very high, and questions are starting to come up about Tammy's death. So the police decided to exhume Tammy's body. So she was exhumed in December 2019. The autopsy revealed that she had likely died from asphyxiation. There were signs of her being restrained in the form of anti-mortem bruising. She had foaming at her mouth, which was consistent with drowning or asphyxiation. And I don't understand how if a 49-year-old woman dies suddenly, you can refuse an autopsy. I just don't understand it. But clearly you can. So the day before Tammy was exhumed, on the 12th of December, Alex Cox, Laurie's brother, Died from natural <laughs> causes. <laughs> he was autopsied and it appeared he had a lot of blood blood clots and high pressure, which apparently runs in the family, although I'm suggesting it might be from the stress of running around killing and attacking yeah, people. Murdering people. But, yeah, maybe it was just a, a congenital thing. The grandparents, Kay and her husband, led a whole campaign for information as to where the kids were and even offered a reward of $20,000 for any information. The police formally listed Tylee and JJ as missing in December 2019. How long after is that? They went, they, the last time they were sighted is September. September. And it wasn't so until, no, but it wasn't until late November that the grandparents rang and said, we need a, a check. We, we don't right. know where the kids okay. are. So the family didn't tell the police. So it's about yeah. six weeks, I'd say, right. okay. after yeah. the, they'd been alerted that there was this issue. It's one of those classic stories. You've got posters everywhere. The press are running. The press have picked it up. Where is Tylee? Where is JJ? Have you seen these kids? Any information? All that stuff. The police spent several months trying to find Tylee and JJ. Of course, they got nothing out of Laurie and Chad. They investigated. Are Laurie and Chad l- still in Hawaii? They were in Hawaii. They get extradited back soon but at this point in time yes they are they look at this storage locker in rexburg that laurie had rented on october 19 2019 and they found the belongings of both children and the cctv shows laurie and alex loading the items in november so they rent the place in october and then you see them basically when they when they lit out from that house and they they took everything out of it 
put it in storage and then they abandoned it and then the police showed up the next day. So that's like within 24 hours of when the police showed up to her door and she's given them the bullshit stories. The police arrested Laurie in February 2020 in Hawaii for desertion and non-support of dependent children and she was extradited to Idaho with a bail of a million dollars. In March 2020, documents were reported that identified that Chad and Laurie had decided that JJ and Tylee were possessed and had become zombies. Laurie told her friends that JJ was watching TV all day and being difficult. And, you know, Swanee? I've got three here. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But clearly it's an obvious conclusion to come to. And I think also we probably should take into account that JJ could well have seen his stepfather Charles killed. You know, so he could have been actually just yeah, yeah. reacting as well, anyone. Well, they, they both trauma. could have too. And by the way, yeah. mum and dad, mum has gone batshit crazy, and she's spending all her time with this bloke. I mean, it's just. Uh, and I think Tylee, same. Tylee's seventeen, right? And she'd already complained that Tylee was difficult, but she's a teenager, and she's probably already traumatized. And her mother's being a real nut job. But oh, no, sorry, no, they're zombies. But what if they did see the murder of their dad? And so they've got to get rid of them because they're well. That's a possibility. Going to tell the police at some point. They never up up until this point because that was back in June, I think, or July. They hadn't said anything. But I, I just, I just think they became inconvenient. If I'm honest, yeah. So. In June 2020, the police searched Chad Daybill's property in Rexburg, focusing on an area called the Pet Cemetery because it had dead pets in it. <laughs> Been a text to Laurie back from Chad back in September, which is remember the last time we see the kids. Man, they talked yeah. about him seeing a raccoon running along a fence that he shoots it and then he buries it in the Pet Cemetery. He also talked about burning the limbs of a tree in the fire pit which is sort of weird mm. shit to be sending to you anyway, but it's also weird. Yeah. The, police thought, the police thought this was odd because raccoons are nocturnal. It's code. Yeah, maybe. And the investigator's like, none of this makes sense. But it makes them go to this pet cemetery because they're like, there's a reference to this, so maybe there's something in it. So they dig the area out and they find hidden under the remains of some animals, like a ply, I think it's like a plywood panel, a piece a wood panel, Underneath that, there are some large flat stones, I'm assuming like flag stones, and underneath that they find poor JJ's body. He had been bound, so he was pretty much all wrapped up in plastic and he'd been bound with duct tape and his head had been wrapped with plastic to suffocate him and then I think the rest of him was wrapped up in bin bags. And the investigators did make a comment about that it was a very meticulously planned burial he sort of got the other remains out. Like it was just, it was just a really odd. Yeah, yeah. it's thing. well hidden. Yeah, yeah. It hasn't been done quickly either. But that's another thing. That take a little bit of time to get other things out, put it underneath. Yep, and uh, I'm yeah. guessing that you know, like the stones and the timber is to stop animals from digging it up, but also put more pets on dead pets on top, so that if you've got a body dog coming in to do the sniffing, then they will smell the animals. So mm. it's quite interesting. Of course, they continued to search the property and they found Tylee's remains buried elsewhere. So she wasn't in the pet cemetery. She had been burned in the fire pit and so the cause of death is not known. And Holy shit. Oh, they just... did this to them, their mum? Well, I'll get on. I'll or, get, or Chad I'm not or sure. both. We don't oh, really know, but I'll, I'll get on to it. And what's interesting is when they're searching the property, it's terrible. It's almost, I, I don't understand it. Tyler's almost desecrated, and whereas JJ is, you know, in a and I, I, I don't know. It, it to me, it feels like rage or something. Like why they've treated Tyler like that anyway? Differently, yeah. yeah she yeah. was a four point one T. You just don't understand the scale. It's true, though, because I imagine if in most instances, I assume the kids are going to be killed the same way and, and buried together yeah, in a similar yeah. fashion. Yeah. It, I didn't. The fact that there's yeah. a discrepancy and so vast between the two, they've treated them differently based on. Some, one of their beliefs probably, somebody's more demonic or more possessed than Possibly. the Possibly. Or she fought harder or something. She's yeah, easier, to, yeah, sure. he's easier to kill. Well, I mean, yeah. even that's sad because they found scratch marks on his neck and stuff suggesting that he was clawing at the plastic bag and he put oh, up a bit of a fight. Oh, yeah. don't, don't. And don't, they found. Don't. I have nightmares. See, see one, of the, one of these, I don't understand how this was pertinent, but in the. And it might, might be wrong. It might, I'm making a, I'm drawing a connection between two facts here. But in when we get to it, there's a piece of DNA comes into the court case late in evidence, 
which then takes the death penalty off the table. And I didn't understand why. And then I later read that they found Tylee's DNA on a pickaxe in the shed or something on the property. And there are marks on the pelvic bones which are consistent with something like a pickaxe being used. And I, But we have no understanding of when or how or whatever. You do know what I mean? So we don't know whether they mm. killed her with a pickaxe or that was part of disme- uh, uh, trying to dispose of the body or who knows, right? It's all a bit weird. Anyway. So moving on from that. So what was it? What also happened in this? So Chad's sitting in his car, right, while they're searching his property, and there's a phone do they, call. Do, do they know he's outside? Yeah, and there's a phone oh. call between Laurie and Chad, again recorded, and I, I'm assuming someone's tapping their phone at this point. Laurie rings him and says, "Oh, hey, babe, how are you?" And he says, "Like, like, um, uh, well, uh, they're searching the property," and she's quiet, and she goes. They searching inside the property, and he's like, "No, <laughs> they're searching the property." And she's like, "All right." And then he goes, "Yeah, so we're just gonna have to see how that pans out, kind of thing." And then the awkward, awkward, and then she's like, "All right, well, let me know if you need anything." And he's like, "Okay." And then it's love you, love you, and the hat and. Then, of course, he realises that they found something. So he tries to piss off down the road in his car and, of course, the police immediately <laughs> follow him and pick him up and arrest him. So, But the fact that he runs away when he sees that they found something too is like mm. he knows, he absolutely knows what they're going to yeah, find. Yeah. And that conversation between she knows too, you know. Anyway, yeah. so, uh, so Chad having done a runner down the road, gets picked up by the police and he gets arrested for obstruction and concealment of evidence and then later with felony murder. On the 2nd of July, prosecutors dropped two charges against Laurie related to desertion and non-support of dependent children and instead charged her with obstruction and concealment of evidence (laughs) regarding her children's remains. There's good news. Yeah. 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 You're off I the told hook. you we'd get you off. <laughs> <laughs> in light of the two felony counts against Laurie having been dropped, her bond was lowered by Madison County Judge Michelle Mallard. The bond was set to fifty thousand for each charge, totaling one hundred fifty grand. It was further noted that Chad would still need to post a million bucks in Fremont County to be released from jail. A jury trial for the Madison County charges against Laurie was set for January twenty five to twenty nine, twenty twenty one. On May 25th, 2021, Chad and Laurie were indicted on charges of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and grand theft by deception for the uh, for the deaths of Tylee and JJ and Tammy and, of course, for taking the insurance money. Um, Laurie was also charged with grand theft related to Social Security survivor benefits because, remember, I think this is to do with JJ being disabled. Mm. She might have been Autistic. taking benefits as well, Yes. Chad faced an insurance fraud charge related to the life insurance policy he had on Tammy, Tammy Dabble, for which he was the beneficiary and received the 430000 for her death, or after her death rather. On May 27th, 2021, Laurie was found incompetent and unfit to stand trial and her case was stayed. She has since been deemed competent to stand trial after mental yes. health treatments and on March 21st, 2023, The judge removed the death penalty, this is what I was talking about, from Laurie Vallow due to the newly uncovered DNA evidence, which was discovered too close to the trial to be tested and admitted to court. I still don't quite understand why that takes the death penalty off the table, but anyway. A lot comes out in the trial, and I'm not going to go into all of it. The highlights include statements from the inner circle, including Melanie Palowski, who was Bordaroo before, who married Pulowski after knowing him for 10 days and he then almost immediately tried to entrap Laurie and Chad for the police. They're they're great guys, these. Her ex-husband, Brandon, who was also on the stand and who, by the way, was shot at two weeks before Tammy died. So remember Tammy got shot at about 10 days before she died. So the week before she was shot at, Brandon was shot at as well. Unfortunately, they missed, and it was all to do with that divorce. And everyone suspects good old Uncle Alex was the one who shot at him. But, of course, it's fine because he was a zombie. And <laughs> Melanie Gibb 
who played that phone call that she'd secretly recorded. And we also had hundreds of thousands of SMS messages and emails that the prosecution used to show that Chad and Laurie had plotted to kill JJ, Tylee and Tammy, as all three were obstacles to their happiness. The testimony of Zulema Pastenis, who was Alex's wife, she talked about Laurie's visitations by angels and voices and that the day after she married Alex, as in Zulema married Alex, he admitted to killing Charles and was worried that Laurie and Chad were setting him up to take the fall, though it didn't matter that he killed Charles because he was a zombie. Uh, the trial was, I'm not shitting you, it's true. The trial it's obviously made you a sensation. Yep, uh, as you might expect. And honestly, I could probably go on for a, a bit longer about what come out, but I won't. Sexy text messages, murder plots, a load of people dying suddenly or being murdered, a number of others who testified they were concerned they would be next, and frankly, fair enough, because they were definitely on the list. And it seems the main yeah. qualification for being a zombie or possessed by a dark spirit was not agreeing with Laurie and Chad, and they were the judge, jury, and with help from Alex, the executioner. I'm pretty sure Chad killed Tammy, in my opinion. What we do know is that he sent a text to Laurie prior saying that she'd been switched for a demon and that he was trying to hasten her departure on. I don't mm -hmm. know if he killed the kids, but we do know that on the days they believe Tylee and JJ were killed and buried, Uncle Alex's phone records showed that he was at Chad's place for about two hours in the location oh. of the pet cemetery. So it's likely he either the uncle he either helped to bury the children or he did the murders or they you know was part of it. What got me was that Chad, knowing that those children were buried in his backyard, went on living with Tammy in that house for a month before he then either killed her or had her killed. Oh, yeah. And again, what would Jesus say, Chad? So the kids were gone before the wife was. Yeah. So that's why. So when the wife the was gone, issue that I had. So where was Laurie then? Just at home. Laurie and Wait, the children the kids moved to Rexborough after Chad's death, so that's July. So between after Chad's death, after hang on, Chad, Charles sorry, Charles, death. Charles's death, that, Charles, Charles death. dies in July. Yes, I knew that. Yep. yep. After that, so I, but I'm just saying, if her kids are killed, she's just hanging around waiting for him to get rid of the wife. Yeah. yeah and ordering and rings he does. online. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Which, by the way, in their wedding photos, she's wearing the rings that she'd ordered. And also in the wedding photos, mm. which is part of why investigators were like, well, there's something seriously wrong. No sign of either children, obviously. So we, they weren't at the wedding. We definitely know that. So on May 12th, 2023, Laurie Vallow Daybell was found guilty on all criminal charges in a Boise, Idaho courtroom. On July 31, 2023, she was sentenced to consecutive life sentences for, respectively, Good. the murder of Tylee, the murder of JJ and the conspiracy to commit murder charged for Tammy. In addition of fi to fines and restitution for the oh, grand child. Chad is still pending trial. Hang on, I'll get back to Charles. Okay. Laurie has also been charged with conspiracy to murder in relation to Tammy Daybell and Charles Vallow okay, sorry. and will be tried at a later time for that, though given she has consecutive life sentences, it's a bit of a moot point, I suppose, but apart from Charles's family who'd like to see her pinned for what she did. But there you go. There you have it. And I'm surprised that no one went the folly of deux because either they were two crazy people who were got into their own, you know, insanity or they were just calculated killers after money, sex and power or he was a narcissist who sucked in a tragic woman who was primed to believe the fantastic. So what do you think? Wow. I've got a question before I answer that. Has there yeah. been anything in since she's gone trial? Does, does Laurie ever speak? She Has she ever she, said She anything? didn't. No, she didn't take the stand. As far as I understand it, there were almost no defence witnesses either. I've heard lots of, you know, scurrilous stuff like jurors saying it was the face of evil looking at her. <laughs> but she she certainly seems to have spent her entire time from the time she was arrested to now being more concerned about Chad and protecting oh, Chad. Oh, still, because that was my next question, which was have they turned against each other or are they still? No. Oh, okay, no. No, no, but remember they have had 21 past lives together, so. I guess there is that. No, but uh, sometimes that even the 21 past lives when you end up at the end of your life because you're about to go to prison for the rest of it or whatever else might it force you matter. down a little bit. But I suppose it doesn't really matter when you know that you're just going to meet again in the next life. That's true. Mm. 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 Well, I wonder if I they mean, were going to it, turn against each other. One might think it 
but might think of it as a, an incredible love story of our time. Um, no. But I think they're just, she's, something went wrong with her, definitely. And there's no evidence, I think, that she was with anywhere near when the children were killed. And she wasn't there when Tammy was killed. She may well have been, and I think she was there when Charles was killed. But she definitely knew all about it and all of this who's a zombie and who's a zombie and all that led to all of this. That's so she's culpable. Speak. I reckon. Yeah, I, yeah, I, but she's I, totally culpable. I feel oh, like and then she's there's the this thing about death percentages it. too. I don't. I think I really Chad. do. I think I think she's I reckon she's pulling levers with her brother Alex and I reckon she's pulling levers with Chad. And she's making them go and do Some people think that, what yeah. she wants. Yeah. yeah, and I do. I do. I am. Um, this is, as I said at the I start, this is one that I'd looked into a little bit quite a while back and I'd been waiting for her to get sentenced. I, I think mm. the way that she acted through all of that, you know, the, the whole thing in Hawaii, because they were there for quite some time and she was just playing dumb and oh, she, she's just one of those people it's that just I disgusting just disgusting that they were it's wandering awful. around. On the oh. beach, smiling, knowing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Because it was a big media case too. It's, it's really yeah. awful. Oh, it's disgusting. Yeah. And the ordering the rings in she, between the two. She's just oh, yeah. foul. Oh, something like, oh, I've got great news. You know, Tammy's now been taken over by a demon. I'm going to hasten it along. It's, yeah. You've seen what Chad looks like. He's definitely batting above his bloody weight with her, right? So she was... She doesn't look so good now. She's a little bit. She doesn't look so good now. Yeah, she looks no. more hard than she's put aged away a bit. Now. Yeah, she does now. She's she's uh, she's <laughs> found it all a bit. What's that saying, sorry, Clarky? Wrote, wrote right. hard and put away wet. That's she's, how I feel. So if you think though about the number of people that died, the only one that I think Chad would be responsible for is Tammy, and I. I think that there's absolutely a chance that Chad was involved in the death of particularly JJ given the asphyxiation. But Alex, you know, with his nut tasering of Joseph who possibly didn't do what he said, the killing of Charles... I think she's got a longer history of, of murder as a solution. The and shooting at... On the, the shooting yeah. at Brandon and the yeah. shooting at Tammy, yep. Yeah, I, so I think I do think it sits with her at the core of it, not to say that Chad isn't, particularly with Tammy, particularly a part of it, but, but I think she's the she's the real monster in all of this. I don't think Alex mm. would have done any of it but for her. A little bit like Oh, no, I agree. That's why I, said, that's why I said at the beginning that Alex was a bit of a lost boy, really. She's a bit of a puppeteer, isn't she? I think so, yeah. It's that, you know, I'll get other people to do the bad things and then I'll just sit at the centre of it and play dumb. and Possibly, but I... I I'm not exonerating Chad. No. I'm not either. I Chad, think she's Chad's she's, an absolute dickhead. Uh, but they're both complete dickheads. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I got all of that. They seem to be like these people who believe their own hype. Like, I mean, they just get so caught up in their own importance. They can and teleport. Though, everything and change the they weather. <laughs> well, frankly, they can do all those things, but they can't. She talks directly to Jesus. Yeah, but I mean, they use little code you, words and, you know, it's, it's all yeah, just this, this horrible yeah. little, you know, childhood fantasy that they're living in their adult life. Well, and I then think the problem is they both got it. infected by loin fire at the beginning of this. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and, it, and then it became brain fire. Isn't that? And things went terribly syphilis? wrong. Syphilis? Syphilis yeah, has, yeah, has yeah. a similar impact, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes it go nutty too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So sentence then. <sighs> it's a hard I've got an idea. Yeah, um, no. So when the rapture happens, they're not <laughs> part of the one hundred forty-four thousand. They're not leading. Be them. given. That's right. Passage. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, they're not they're just them, being, yeah. yeah. They're going straight to hell. They go. I'm done. Because that would be the biggest thing that could upset them. Mine's similar, it was to do with the rapture, but I want them to experience the rapture all that like perpetually. So it doesn't just come and then Jesus says, all right, you can go, you can go, and that's it. And they're just almost always on this rotation of going up to their mate Jesus, who they have all these good chats with, and Jesus saying, I want Jesus Get to be like the headmaster me. where he goes, Yeah, what the fuck did you pair think you're up to? <laughs> I saw all of that shit. <laughs> now tell everybody else here who you thought you were and what was going on. You thought you were my best mate. <laughs> who I've never met you before. And here you are saying you know me. 
<laughs> and here is the answer to the question. What would Jesus say, Chad? Jesus yeah. would say, I've never met you before. How dare you say what I was saying? Who's Chad? I've never met the guy. <laughs> can we put that? Can we put that on merch? Who the fuck is Chad? Yeah. Yeah, that's a new one. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, good. I agree. <coughs> Jesus basically just publicly humiliates Chad and totally. Lyra going, Chad get away from me, oh I don't God, know who you are. Pair. In the name of you the Father, the Son, yeah. the Holy Spirit, be gone. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, you're at the back end of that uh, queue, mate. You're not even in the queue, straight downstairs. Well, no. All right. And Clarky? Similar but a little bit different. So I want Ned Schneider <laughs> to bring oh. back all of the people that um, Laurie and Alex and Chad killed and then replicate them so there's now a zombie army of people that they've killed who can then go and chase uh, uh, probably like in a in a movie, a, an apo- a zombie apocalypse movie, but more Who Framed Roger Rabbit style. So... They're the real ones, but the zombie army is cartoon and they just right. get chased by the zombie army for the rest of eternity. And they probably will never win be and when you kill a zombie and just gets back up again, like in um yeah. I don't watch many things like that, but I have seen is it World War Z with Brad Pitt? That's a zombie movie, isn't it? When there's like hordes yeah. of zombies going over sort of like uh, Yeah. I am Legion. It's Monuments or, you know. And then Ned Schneider is like the Night King in Game of Thrones. So whenever they kill the zombies, <laughs> he just reincarnates them all again and then they can keep chasing them. Well, so they never can rest again. Wasn't, well, they were zombies, weren't they? They were basically Well, yeah, but so they'd zombies. get killed yeah. and then he'd, rep, he'd bring them all up yeah. again. So Ned Schneider has the power to yeah. bring them all back to half-life. Good old Ned Schneider, eh? If someone told that story, I'd go, oh, I've never watched Game of Thrones, but I know who Ned Schneider is. (laughs) And I'd be like, who's Ned Schneider? I'd be like, who's the Night King? I know who Ned Schneider is. Never heard of the Night King. Who the fuck's Chad? Yeah. Ned Schneider. I think we should get, we should get. Hold up a bit. um, First of all, can we get Laurie and Chad down the front, please? No, we're like, (laughs) here we go here. You pair. What yeah, a mess. What a, what a shit show they are. <laughs> yeah. now, I've got two little angels here to meet you, Tylee and JJ. Yeah. Oh, mm. God, that's so so disturbing. I, that's Awful. the thing, right, when you mm. when you clearly no, I think I can't believe some of the stuff we listen to. So you'd have seen the pictures of them and they're just lovely kids. I think it's I started awful. watching this on Netflix quite some time ago. Yeah. Sins of a Mother. Yeah. Sins of a Mother. And then, mm. yes, Mm. Uh, God, it was in this house. I don't know when it was. Maybe it was last year. It was a Could fair be. while ago. And then I don't know how to cope. Well, I didn't actually finish it because. I mean, they're almost serial killers. Yeah, well, they sort of. Created yeah. a bit of a mess and then kept going. With other murders over love, sometimes there's, you know, a, a mass killing or whatever where, you know, three or four people die. They've done this, you know, multiple times. Oh, yeah. Across it. It's. it's it's so premeditated and so calculated and just ugh. evil. Just they fucking really are divorce people. messed up. And the thing that I have the the worst, oh, the worst. One of the things I have a real issue with is why is it that when people who think that they're good, yeah, and people think that you know, usually it does relate to religion, unfortunately. But you know, when people have this sense that they are better than everybody else or more connected with whoever their god is or whatever else they're the worst right because they're yeah. just well they're you know, evangelistic all these and things they're yes. irritating because they're always telling you they're trying to shove it down your throat it's like believe what you like but it and it's and the irony is as you say and it is ironic that they aren't being humble they None aren't, being they aren't they're living any to of be. those things they're just Not going Oh, I, my mate Jesus, he tells me. I'll I'm pick like, a few oh. things out and I'll, you know, work to that and then the rest of the stuff I'll ignore the things that are actually fundamentally what you should be just to be a good person and then I'll amp up Someone stuff. who's quite Awful. close to me likes to consider themselves a good Jesus? Christian. Jesus? No, no, So no. I didn't know if that was an no. in. Oh, a, it's not. A mortal not. person, not a celestial being. <laughs> that was a joke. I know, I know. Uh, a bad one, obviously. Be, no. Whenever no. I have to tell someone it's it was a joke, good. it's a problem. Sorry. <laughs> Someone who's quite close to you. Oh, yes, Laurie. Who would that be? <laughs> Jesus. Ned Schneider. Sorry, sorry Schmitty. <laughs> Ned Schneider. <laughs> no, she's not close to Ned Schneider. A person Child, who's though. relatively close to me who likes to consider themselves a good Christian and who I often think 
doesn't always behave in a fashion that is in line with Christianity. I like to say to them, they, they do a lot of charity work with like St. Vincent Charities. Paul or, you know, a charity. <laughs> and I, I say, that's your evil offset program, like your carbon offset. <laughs> <laughs> you go and do your, your charity work. Brilliant. Because that's it's brilliant. offsetting what an asshole you are the rest of the time. So, mm. yes. I, Maybe I know that's what, what Laurie and Chad need to be sentenced to an evil offset program because they weren't doing any good whilst they're doing all of this bad. That would just true, true. Uh, uh, I'm happy to send them on some kind of evil off. I mean, <laughs> evil offset. Yes, evil, evil offset. Evil offset world in trial by wine world. <laughs> we just did good works, all charity, <laughs> all very good things. That's hard, right. hard work. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you very much, guys. As we say every week, miss you already. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Thanks for listening to Trial by Wine. You can contact us at trialbywine at gmail.com. Please rate, review and subscribe to Trial by Wine on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to support us, you can become a patron at www.patreon.com, Trial by Wine. Or visit our website, www.trialbywine.com to donate to us. Your support will help us cover many more cases and apply wacky sentences. We really appreciate you listening and hope you tell everyone about us. Our cover art is by John Christo and music is by Beauchamp from pixabay.com.